All right, well, we're going to go ahead and get going because, um, quite frankly, we don't need the whole period. And I, I, I know at least one person has a flat tire. I know someone else is sick. Um, so we're going to record this. We'll put it online. If you run into those people, uh, let them know that the most important thing is we got to get your, your uh, cameras signed out to you so that we can get it to the business office so that you don't get hit with some late bill um, later in the semester. So it is 165 for the rest of the semester. We are turning them back in on April 25th. That'll be our last class period. Um, and we'll make that a work day to turn these in and finish up stuff. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, as, as before, uh, you guys already know, if you have your own camera, you do not need to check one of these out. That is perfectly fine. Callie likes her Nikon, um, essentially the same camera. And it's, it's very important to, to remember that the, uh, there is not one um, perfect camera. There is not one that does checks all the boxes exactly. Um, some of them do this thing really well and some of them do this other thing really well. These, I particularly like these myself just on my own uh, experience for photography. They're really nice photography cameras. So they have an APS-C sensor that is slightly bigger than our G85, has a micro four thirds. That is one of the main things that sets a price point in a camera system. So this is a mid-range Canon, and uh, originally they ran around like 1,000, 1,200 bucks, depending on um, what came with them, a lens or like a microphone or a bag, because uh, they offer a lot of kits. And so over the last few years, we've purchased roughly 24 of these or something like that, somewhere in the mid-20s. Uh, we have only sent off one that entire time. It was, like number 18 or 19 just had a software issue that we couldn't do in house. Uh, so that becomes one of my issues with Canon and has been for quite a while is there's not much you can do to a Canon yourself. If there's like a software issue, you've got to send that off. Um, and if it's in the warranty period, which these very much aren't, then, then they'll cover that, but you're still going to get stuck with some shipping somewhere in there. Uh, the, the, the process is really finicky. Um, and I'm mentioning this because now that you're in advanced production techniques, a lot of you are in the market for cameras. And so that makes a big difference on uh, who you might choose, who you might purchase from. I had uh, an, a pro model DSLR Canon for a while that I really, really liked. Um, this has been a few years, but it got sent off for a similar software issue, wouldn't read SD cards for whatever reason. Not something I could fix myself, uh, even with my experience in taking cameras apart and you know other accessories and stuff. Uh, in media production. So I had to send it off. It was covered that first time because it was still in the warranty period. A few months later, exact same problem happened. And then it cost me about 400 bucks. The camera ran for like 1200 bucks um, without like all the accessories and stuff. So that was very frustrating because now the camera started getting expensive, literally a third of what I paid originally, um, somewhere, you know, somewhere in those ballparks. It's been a long enough, it might've been 1500 for the camera. Um, now I've paid that and it's had that issue twice. And so when I asked Canon, I called them and I asked, I was like, what are the odds it's gonna happen a third time? Cause now I've literally at least over half my, my expenses paid for the camera one and a half times. Um, and they were very rude to me. I'm not gonna lie. They were extremely rude to me. Um, and so I ended up being very frustrated. I sold that camera um, and bought a Panasonic GH5 that was really remarkable about six years ago. And I just loved that camera and I, I enjoyed making that switch. Now, since then, I've been shooting Canon R5s, Canon C70. Um, I really love a lot of things about Canon. I like that they have a lot of options for, for lenses, which is super important. Um, the lenses, in a lot of ways, are arguably more important than the, the camera you're using. And Canon tends to have a lot of third-party brands um, and even themselves cover a wide range of glass or lenses. So the Canons are a nice viable option. They have a wonderful color space. It looks really, really nice right out of the camera. And so um, for the most part, I still shoot Canon probably most of the time in between running drones, GoPro, occasionally a red, occasionally a Panasonic. Uh, it really depends on the project. Um, if I was building this program from scratch, I'd probably have a bunch of black magics. But when I first came here, they didn't have the options that they have now. And one of those other things about Blackmagic that I really enjoy, most of them are either micro four thirds lenses, which also have a ton of options. And a lot of the other ones are either EF 
lenses like uh, mounts like these or they have an option to uh, switch that out. So when we bought the Blackmagic Ursa 12K, that's our big uh, clunky camera, pretty heavy camera, it came with a PL mount and I was able to take that out and put in an EF mount lens uh, mount so that I was able to use all our Canon glass on, on that Blackmagic. So um, some of you, like Andrew's running the, the G85 this semester, unless you wanna switch to a Canon, you can, it's up to you. There's nothing big and astronomically different between the two. Uh, I do like that camera a lot also, but we just haven't quite, eventually these will be phased out and the G85s will probably be the primary student camera for first years, just as we go through. Um, let's look at, this one must be on an auto setting of some sort. And like I said, these two models right here are, are for sale. Uh, because we've had them long enough that the college gave us permission to liquidate them out. And they're $350 as is. They come with two batteries, charger, lens, um, and that's pretty much it. But if you were to buy that right now by a used T6i, you're probably going to spend around six, dollars $700 for that similar um, setup. But, and a very huge but, is you will not have a warranty with these buying them from me. I cannot return them. Um, and I can't service them. Like I said, you'll be stuck sending them off to Canon if you run into an issue. Nobody's had that issue out of the six or eight that we've sold so far, um, but they are mechanical devices that are inevitably going to, to die at some point. Uh, I say that, but my T3i that I bought back in 2011, 2010, we still use. Um, we still have it in our inventory and my company still takes it out and uses it for stuff here and there, uh, partly just to see if the thing will still turn on because it's so old, but it's really cool. Uh, so yeah, they've been a really nice uh, system, the T, the T series. They had, uh, I shot a lot with a T2i on a marketing team, all photography. I didn't use the video function very much, uh, but we did magazine ads and stuff with it sometimes because it shot a really nice raw uh, file if you had enough light. Um, then I bought a T3i with, for my company early, early on. It was the first camera for that company. And then the T4i came out, giving you kind of a history lesson here. The T4i was out for just a few months, just riddled with issues. And instead of doing updates and fixing it, um, they just came out with the T5i because there was enough problems. And I can't recall what they all were, but the T4i was just a complete uh, trash model of the series. And then the T5i came out. Um, if you remember Jason Anderson, he went through the program recently. He had a T5i that he's had for years. And uh, one of my clients bought a T5i that they really liked. So, that's the only two models of those I've had experience with. And then our T6 size, like I said, we've had a couple dozen and they've just been great. Really, really great. <clears throat> okay, let's, ju let's just look through real quick to give you kind of a quick reminder. Um, on the top of the camera, let's see here. I can tilt that. I haven't played with this tripod. Oh, it's this one. So we're looking on the top. Actually, before I do that, let's, yeah, I can't do it with that exact one. So I haven't used it in a while. Um, so we're using a T6i to get shots of a T6i. If you can see here in person, it's pretty grainy. These are not great low light cameras. So I expect you guys this semester to check out lights more often, more frequently. Last semester was more about just kind of getting comfortable with the, um, focus racking, uh, f-stop, what is ISO, those kind of things. This semester, I want you to incorporate more camera rigs like tripods, monopods, and more lights so your, your quality of your, your productions goes up slightly. Um, but you can see it's kind of grainy, and that's because I have it on auto ISO. So it's cranked all the way up to the max, which is 6400 ISO. These cameras do not have um, a great extended ISO range, and they, they do not do well really past, once you get into like the 2000s up, it's, it's a pretty grainy image. You can see it kind of falling apart right here. Um, depending on what you're shooting, if you're doing um, something documentary style, there's a little more forgiveness there. But if you're doing something narrative, fictional, and it's supposed to be cinematic, that's one of those things that can kind of knock you down a little bit because it just doesn't look quite as clean. Um, I'm gonna have to stop recording for you. Well, I'm gonna look at this. Okay, so on the top, 
Um, when I found both these cameras, they were set to P. P is one of those auto settings. I don't want you in auto settings. I know in your photography class, he has you dabble with auto settings so you understand what they are. I don't want you messing with that. P is not gonna be an option in a professional camera, so I don't even wanna encourage that direction in, in a advanced production techniques. I want everyone to be in auto for M, or excuse me, manual for M, and that's where you will have all of your functions that you can control yourself. Now, even though I'm in M, I could still do auto ISO. You do not wanna do that. Um, now, there is, of course, exceptions. So say Judah's at a football game, and he's running from the tunnel to the locker room, out to the field. Auto ISO is kind of helpful there because it's adjusting on the fly for you so you can get that story. You can follow that coach, you can follow that quarterback. That's, a, that's one of those scenarios where it's not such a bad deal. But if you're following your actor from this room outside to their car, then you need to plan that out so you can have the proper settings. If that is, you know, say like a comedy or like a suspense film, you don't want that ISO tr adjusting on you on the fly unless you run through it enough times and, and you're comfortable with it. But I don't want to confuse you guys too much with all of this stuff. There's a lot of options. Um, mainly, make sure you're in M for manual and that you click it all the way up to the camera so that you are able to shoot a video. Um, we've done photography assignments. There's photography classes that I highly encourage you to take. Most of our students do. So if you do want to dabble with the photography, absolutely. But in advanced production techniques, it's going to be like our next project is doing a short film with a motif. Um, you're going to be in the video mode in this class. So, but that doesn't mean that um, if your cousin has a baby and wants to give you 100 bucks to take photos, you should do those kinds of things. Those are great ways to pay off your 165. Um, any student who is open to other projects and uh, opportunities pays off their rental um, in just a couple, three projects, no problem. Uh, and many times it's not crazy to get a couple hundred bucks to go shoot an event for say third Thursday or something. And um, you just gotta, just gotta reach out and look for those opportunities. <clears throat> okay, um, any questions about just that very basic start? Being in manual, being at the top. I know it's kind of review, hopefully it's review. <laughs> um, but I wanna get you guys back into the groove of things because you've had a few weeks off and even last week technically was more off. We should have, would have liked to have been doing this on Tuesday. Um, on the top, we have a hot shoe mount. That's what that's called. You can add a flash uh, if you are utilizing um, like wedding photography and you know that the environment's gonna change a lot. Um, I like to put a flash on top when I'm shooting bugs and like macro, something really tiny that needs extra light uh, and maybe a dark space. You can also add things like a monitor that may not talk to the camera. It may not be electronically connected, but it just has kind of a, a solid uh, base to it. So it can be used as a holder for, for things like that. A microphone is really common. I'm sure everybody's tried that at some point, uh, attaching a, a little shotgun mic to the top. Uh, just to keep in mind some of the silly things that reminds me back to the first time I used one. Um, we had you know a dead cat with the fur on it and we were shooting a, a mountain bike documentary in college and the, the fur kept getting into our shot and it ruined one of our camera angles for the entire shoot. So that, that camera was completely unusable because we had fur fluffing off in the top part of the frame and we just didn't catch it. Um, and it's part of learning, it's fun. So hot shoe mount, but it doesn't have to be hot, can be cold. Uh, these both don't have straps, but you can see the strap holders on the top. I don't like using straps for anything unless I'm out in the field by myself hiking. Um, football game, great time to use a strap, but if I'm, if I'm gonna be in a studio with a tripod, that strap just becomes another thing that can get caught on stuff. Um, and I've, I've seen where a strap just gets kind of like snagged and, and knocks stuff over. So be careful of that, be leery of those kinds of things. Now on this particular model, I'm gonna tilt it back up. Our EVF, electronic viewfinder on the top, that um, is only for photography on the T6Is. Other camera models, you can look through that, you can set up settings and you can see video through it. That's a relatively new feature the last couple years. Um, depending on if you're shooting like a Sony or uh, Panasonic, they will do that. My Canon R5 does that. Uh, but for this camera, you're only in video mode off of our uh, uh, movable LCD screen. 
So that, that EVF is kind of useless unless you're doing time lapses or just general photography. Um, let me get a little better focus here. These cameras are popular for vloggers because it flips around and you can see yourself uh, and kind of see what you're doing if you're a one-man band, which, you know, some people come with some pretty interesting projects off of that too. Um, I know a few years ago, Joy Reese did a sci-fi where she was kind of documenting her own world because uh, she was the last person on earth or something. Um, and they got into a film festival too. Uh, and I, she shot a lot of it articulated because it was like she was narrating her own story and it was, it was a good little, little film. I can't remember the name of it. But that little uh, articulated LCD screen gives you that ability to move that around. I personally, because um, unless I'm looking low, and this one's battery auto save or power mode is set to just a few minutes apparently. Um, when it's out like this, obviously it's vulnerable. So unless I'm going high or looking low, which I like to do a lot, get creative angles, don't be lazy and just shoot standing like this. Uh, you guys are better than that. Get out on the ground, move around, and so you can see things better. But if you're not, if you're just doing like a straight on interview, which you know is something that we do a lot too, I like to have it locked away. Um, it's more protected, it's a little safer, it's uh, out of the way entirely. And then when I'm traveling, I want you guys to travel with it closed, just for obvious reasons. Now, we've never had an issue. Maybe people are actually listening to that. Um, but that's, um, it's just a little safer like that. I can't say that I'm 100% perfect. Mine uh, in my bag's always closed up. Your bag should be packed well so that you don't have things bumping into it. Your camera should not be in contact with anything else. I was literally on a shoot with an alumni this last semester for a professional shoot. He stuffed two lenses in the same case. About lost my mind. Anyways, you're not always perfect. <laughs> I'm sure I've done something similar. Uh, but just be cautious of those things. Most equipment is, is damaged in transit. It's not actually usually damaged on set. Um, that's typically where it happens. So be careful about that. Now in that same breath, uh, Look at our extreme temperatures right now. If you leave equipment outside, it will not make it through these, these environments. What usually happens is batteries go really bad and also these LCD screens can't handle that cold. And so then you start getting lines through and pixels start dying. Um, and that is one of those things that we can't fix in house either. And at this point, these cameras don't hold enough value for me to get them repaired. I'm not gonna spend $350 to fix a $350 camera. So don't, let, don't leave them in your car. Just be ca cautious of that. Don't leave anything in your car. Um, I would argue almost that the cold is a little worse than the heat in the summertime, but really quite frankly in Kansas, you shouldn't leave anything in your car ever. Um, and in one occasion, at least one that, I'm, that I can think of off the top of my head, uh, someone left their camera bag in their car. Um, someone walked by in the dorms, saw that it was clearly a camera bag and broke his window out. And his window was probably just as expensive as some of the equipment. And camera's gone forever. Windows broke, had to have the police involved. It was just a, a total nightmare uh, all the way around. And we pretty much, it was lose-lose for everybody. So don't leave these. Be, it's your responsibility. It's your equipment. Don't leave it in your car. Keep it with you. Um, take care of it as if it's yours. Because in a lot of cases, um, several times over, students have bought the camera that they checked out throughout, so treat it as if, it, if it's your camera. Okay, that's all kind of stuff that we did back in August, but it's been a while. Questions, thoughts, anything not make sense? Okay, that's all pretty standard stuff. Let's go through and let's talk again about the exposure triangle, how important the exposure triangle is to what you guys are doing. Now, the reason we don't let you have lights for the first few projects in studio and field is so that you get comfortable with the exposure triangle. If I was able to toss this really nice Kino flow or one of the umbrella lights or something, or even the studio grid, it might enable you to not learn the actual settings of the camera and you just get more comfortable throwing more light on it. So try not to do that. Adjust your camera first and then start adding your lights. Um, in this particular case, <coughs> On the bottom left, we can't see all of the jargon. I'll stop recording, we can look at some more of it here in a second, but I like that we can only see the exposure triangle here. Super important, what's this first one? 
with the green brackets. Oh, okay, that's fine. Shutter, thank you. Um, so I'm shooting, and you can't see that, but if I stop recording, I could shoot. Well, you can stop recording. Eh, no. So the shutter speed, um, this could also be called shutter angle. I've heard it called shutter degree. That gets into the more cinema cameras coming from the film days. Um, but in our case, shutter speed, more of a photography term a little bit. Um, I don't adjust this very often. Do you guys remember why? Do you remember what? The scenario with shutter is. It, it causes your motion blur. Thank you. Whether you can see it well on here or not, let's try. So the obvious thing is it darkens it because it's clicking through faster. Now the less obvious thing, because I don't have a great display for you for this, is it is actually I might be able to show you with my hand. I was able to do this in other scenarios. So if I'm at 30, well, you can almost see like my hand following it. It's, it's, it's so blurry because it's opened up. I'm getting more light, but it's also slowing it. Now watch when I speed that to even double of what my frame rate is. It's more jittery. Um, and then if I go too much higher, you won't be able to see it very well. It's like a mirror. So see how I going through like that. And I do have an example video that my brother made last semester that can show you examples of different shutter speeds compared. Does that give you kind of an idea? You're messing with motion blur, and as you mess with motion blur, you are going to, uh, you want that consistent, unless for some reason in the story, your character is going through something. If they uh, are going through a flashback, maybe you mess with motion blur. Um, you see it, uh, shutter speed messed with a lot with drugs. So if you think of like Requiem with the Dream going back a while, some of you guys are pretty young when that came out. Um, but as they had like effects from the drugs, they would mess with things like motion blur and frame rates um, to make it a different effect so it didn't feel real life. <clears throat> but if I'm doing uh, a story, I'm typically double my frame rate. Uh, these cameras, especially being photography cameras, won't do exactly 24 times two at 48. So I like to be just around 50. Now it does do 60 if you're shooting 30 frames per second. And those are your two options because you shoot everything in 1080p. Most of what you do in shutter speed for your shutter speed setting should either be 50 or 60 depending on which frame rate you choose, okay? Um, if I'm doing an interview, I always do it in 24. Uh, I like to have a little extra light coming in. Um, it's that cinematic view, the motion blur to 24 is really consistent in cinema. Uh, there's places where people use 30 and 60, but I, I really um, gravitate towards that 24 frames per second. Um, I know like The Hobbit was done in like 48 and things like that. Um, I don't really get excited about that. I'm kind of old school. I like what I used for the last couple decades. Any questions about shutter? I don't like that it's the first option, but in photography, I adjust shutter all the time, constantly adjusting shutter when I'm out in the field because I like my depth of field to stay consistent with what I'm shooting, and I like my ISO to stay consistent um, for quality purposes. So <clears throat> shutter is actually something I very seldom mess with um, in the film motion realm, and something I mess with regularly in the stills realm. So just something, food for thought. Uh, now my next one is what, if I'm looking in the middle at five, the one that says 5.6? It has a couple different names too. F-stop, what's another one? Aperture, Aperture. Any, you guys got another one? Iris. Iris, you did some research over break. Nice, Andrew. So um, when I'm looking at my aperture, in order to get that, <coughs> that to select over, coming back to my model here, that's close. So if I'm gonna adjust aperture first, I gotta use, uh, the AV click, I click this button, hold it down, and then I use that same wheel to adjust my aperture. So I can go up to, I think, a pretty high, a 36, which is great if you're outdoors, not great pretty much any time you're indoors. Now, 5.6 is what its minimum is right now because these lenses are, are uh, not capable of being a consistent f-stop throughout. So when I open it all the way up, 
I can still get down to a 3.5. Say you're shooting an indoor interview and you've really got to open it up. Now you get into your composition and your camera placement. You might go all the way wide open at a 3.5 and then push that in closer to your subject. So you can, you can have that work for you. Otherwise, if you push in, see how my f-stop automatically adjusts as I telescope. So that's just one of those things um, that a cheaper lens is just not capable of. Uh, and that's why lenses can go from these being roughly 150, give or take, depending. Uh, these all came with the camera, so they're pretty affordable. Uh, all the way up to, I think our most expensive lens was like around four grand maybe. And when I was at the NAB conference in Vegas, um, the National Association of Broadcasters, they had $100,000, $150,000 lenses, uh, particularly called parfocals, where you can zoom all the way out at 1,000 millimeters, get in focus, zoom all the way back um, in, and you are still in focus, and it's pretty, pretty cool. It, it's, if you see, ever watch golf, which, you know, kind of, kind of slow and boring, but if they're following that golf ball through, they're not using one of these lenses, let me tell you that. <clears throat> okay. And then last but not least, it even says it. So what we have, the ISO. Um, if you're looking at some other models, might be called ASA. The only camera in this program that I can recall off the top of my head that says ASA is our original Blackmagic 4K, which still love that little camera. Um, and we talk about it occasionally. I'll do, like, I'll do a run through with you. There is a video on YouTube already where I go through the different camera models. Um, but at some point, we'll talk about all those options. And we'll, we'll not live entirely in the DSLR uh, mirrorless range. We'll, we'll play with some other cameras too. Um, OK, so ISO. Let's see if I can. Where is the? So I'm on my ISO 100 is way too dark. Nope, not auto. Got to go the other way. 200, still can't tell. 400. 800 is where I like to be because of the 800 is in this camera, typically where the battery and the SD card and everything is just functioning kind of at its best. It's kind of its happy speed, but too dark for what I'm doing. So I have to oops, click the button on top. I got to keep going up. 1600, still too dark, but it's not very grainy, which is something I like. So if I were to have more time to set up this, this uh, little studio arrangement, I would bring in an extra light and try to live around 1600 or 800 and have a light on top of this. But for the sake of my time, I didn't, wasn't able to do that. And we've got 1600 to 3200. Starting to be able to see what's going on, but I'm also losing quality of my image. And 6400 is our max. Um, not only do we only have 100 to 6400, but we don't have a whole lot of options in between where a lot of other cameras um, might go 100, 200, uh, 64, or 640, um, and then like 1000, 1200. But these cameras are pretty limited in, in the different options. And that's perfectly okay with what you're trying to do with your learning process in this particular class. And again, bring in lights. A, adjust your settings, open a window. I, when I'm shooting something inside someone's house, I always open up a lot of windows. So um, we sat down with Jaden's family this summer and filmed them for like a couple hours or so, I don't know. Um, and they were just kind of talking about, about growing up and the, you know, their experiences through life. But we opened up, they, your aunt has this really big bay window that just floods light in. And so did we even set up lights? I don't know if we even set, we set up like one. We had one, but if there's so much light coming in, and it was during the day, that makes a difference, um, that we were able to shoot with really nice ISO settings without having to bring a bunch of stuff in. So yeah, 800's where I like to live, but for the sake of what we're doing right now. So where should the main adjustments take place when you're in the exposure triangle? F-stop, thank you. Focus on F-stop first, and then if you have to adjust something, um, ISO would be your second choice usually, and then if you really have to, your shutter speed. Um, and sometimes you're in dire situations where you're traveling to the football team like Judah. We did that um, in 2020 for the national championship. We had to really be adaptable to the scenario 
with what we had. Um, but you know, you can't always control everything. So that's where those other settings are there. But it, when I can, I had my team focusing on the f-stop. So that way we had consistent ISO, consistent shutter speed for a documentary. Okay, I wanna focus, before we leave this screen at the time, does anybody remember the max runtime on our T6i? Right at 30 minutes. I think it might even be 29.59. Um, do you remember why that is? No, I mean, that's a good thought. Actually, battery will dictate that no matter what, if you don't have a full enough battery, obviously. It is because of international shipping tax purposes. For this to be taxed as a photography camera, which is a different bracket, it has to stay under 30 minutes. If it goes over 30 minutes, that puts it into a video camera category, and that makes it more expensive. Um, and you're seeing scenarios right now where like shipping containers are costing 30% more and so on and so forth because of shipping lanes being attacked. Well, this same exact kind of scenario is why this camera is physically capable of shooting longer. The card is, the battery is, all of it is. Um, that camera back there that we're recording on, the C100 is a professional model and it can record as long as the battery will run and as long as the power is running. Um, Andrew, how long was your uh, show that you did? in December? Well, At least an hour, right? The, um, yeah, the show was at least an hour long, but we stopped the camera every so often for uh, battery changes. And but you didn't stop your one that was hardwired, did you? No, we stopped those as well. Oh, you did? Uh, yeah, but uh, so far the camera is um, pretty good. Pretty good. Did, did you run longer than 30 minutes at a time? We ran over uh, 30 minutes. So it's good to point out, Andrew had a, uh, a commission job that wasn't for school. And so when he came to me, he knew about it way in advance, which is super helpful. Um, when I'm trying to help you set up for a project, it helps if it's, if it's early. Will you get him set up? Well, we can do it after this, that's okay. I don't, that way you don't have to miss it. Um, so he told me that it was a live musical, right? Uh, or music, ballet, ballet. So because of that, and we've shot a bunch of that kind of events, we do Dylan Lecture, we handle sports. Um, my company's done uh, different recitals and things, weddings, another area that might run over 30 minutes. Um, you might have an interview that goes over 30 minutes, even though I highly discourage that uh, early on, get comfortable interviewing people and getting what you need in 15 to 20. But um, so when he told me that it was gonna be more than 30 minutes, I knew that the T6i would not work for him. He needed multiple cameras, that's the first thing, uh, for multiple angles. Also, just in case one goes down, it happens, a lot. I've had actually an SD card just die on me while I was recording once during a dance recital. And so during that period, we had to cut and editing to different angles that, because um, that camera was useless at that point. So the, T, the C100s, we have multiple of, great workhorse cameras. Um, and so you checked out three of those, right? And that, that was able, he was able to record as long as the battery is running, as long as he had enough media, then he was able to do that. And in a case of some of them, like right now, I have it hardwired in because over the break, our battery is drained out. <clears throat> so it kind of brings up another point too. You have two batteries per camera. Keep one on the charger when you're out shooting. These batteries don't last forever and they take a while to charge. And that kind of enables them, that trickle charge enables them to last a little longer. So it's a good thing. Uh, but part of what you're gonna get out of this experience in this program um, and that hands-on experience that you, I didn't get in film school uh, being such a, a theory-based scenario, is that, that real-world experience that, oh crap, my battery died and I didn't charge my other one, or I forgot to bring my charger. Um, the number one thing lost in this program, I would say, is battery chargers, left in hotel rooms, left in other places, left on location, um, which always warrants doing one more back pass-through wherever you're shooting at. Uh, very often, you're gonna be out of this building shooting somewhere else. So the first thing is to make the habit of keeping your stuff charged. One goes down, get it on the charger, get the other one in, and then um, going back through your locations at the end of the shoot and making sure that you grabbed everything. There's a good reason why we don't give you more than two batteries. If you build the right habits, you don't need more than two. And if you have three, then I'm gonna be buying batteries every year, that, like with all of our budget. So runtime, batteries, all those kinds of things. Questions about any of that? Okay, 
So I'm going to stop recording this one so I can. Um, and I'll just comment on this real quickly. GoPros do this too. A lot of cameras do this. If you record long enough, then uh, four gigabytes seems to be kind of that split. In order to keep the file not so large so I can process it, yeah. If it's the same thing, it's even less. Yeah. Yeah. Video, yeah. Gigabytes, oh, it was two gigabytes? Every two gigabytes. Okay. That's interesting. I would assume it would have been four. Okay. Um, so in this case, it recorded probably at least eight gigabytes, and so or up to eight gigabytes. So it split it into multiple files. Um, that's partly so the camera can function and handle it itself with processing. But it's really nice for us in editing when you're uploading those files. You can move them better. You can import them into DaVinci and Premiere Pro a little smoother, um, less crashing, hopefully, potentially. Uh, so that's just an, a, a nice feature that you cannot turn on and off that I'm aware of. OK, so all right, let's dig into some of this menu. Some of it matters. Some of it's completely irrelevant, quite frankly. Um, so I'm going to start um, not too worried about this audio here. Just essentially audio is not coming in. Um, you can use microphones. You can make sure you get comfortable with your settings. They are. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in there. We can go through the menu more thoroughly. There's a lot of videos on that. Um, I don't want to spend too much time inside the menu. You should be doing that on your own as well. You need to get comfortable with that because every menu on every camera is absolutely different. Um, this is a Canon. That's a Canon. I own a couple other Canons. None of the menus are the same. So you have to get comfortable with that. The menu in the G85s, if you're living in that one, I think the menu's a little more clunky. I don't like it quite as much. What do you think, Andrew? You're shaking your head as so. Yeah, it's a little bit like change with a bit more features to it. There is some more features, but it's not organized the same either. And quite frankly, the C100, same brand as the T6i's, initializing media and changing like your format and stuff is not in the same places that you might think it would be. So getting comfortable with your camera is very important. But I do want to run through what you're going to see on the back of the LCD screen when you're in your video mode and manual. So we're in full HD. That's what FHD stands for. I wonder if it'll let me, because uh, the screen's turned off there. Now, let me, let's power save mode on this sucker's a little relentless. Um, so when I first turn it on, I'm seeing it pretty basic, but if I want to get these extra this extra information, I push this Q up here, which is right there. I can't push it because I have the HDMI kicking through. But this gives me a lot of features here um, that aren't real visible. And it is temporary. It tries to get it off the screen for your display options. Um, so I can see all these features, lots of things in there. Um, this can change white balance. This can change whether you go from full HD to uh, just uh, 1080p to 720p. I want you to shoot in 1080p for this class. Darn, I wish I could show it to you a little cleaner. It's a little better. Not perfect. Now, the top left, you have some autofocus methods that you could work with. I'm currently in manual focus on the lens, so that's going to override a lot of that. But if I want to click over to auto, you can hear it trying to. I think the autofocus is pretty darn good for these cameras, quite frankly. And it does have the touch option, which is really nice. Um, early on, I was kind of like, man, I want you guys to get comfortable doing this on the lens, especially at the focus racking project. But you can't deny that almost all cameras have this feature, especially in this price point. Um, to work around and see where you can touch different things. Um, in this case, there's not much for it to focus on. In some newer models, you can prioritize things like vehicles, faces, animals. Pretty cool um, how you can, can you have those different things that the camera can try to identify. It's pretty intelligent. There is different autofocus modes that you can try. Um, I, I per personally prefer the tracking if I'm working with people and I'm moving around on a gimbal or something. Uh, if I'm doing 
the, the flexi zone multi kind of covers this whole area that's bracketed in and it's gonna look mostly in there and not so much off to the sides. Nothing too crazy there. Again, play with it, get comfortable with it. When I'm in drive mode, now I have, I'm getting into some photography components. Even though I'm in video, I can still shoot photography. I do not recommend it. It's not gonna be as efficient as just being in photography mode. So I'm just gonna skip over that. I'm gonna turn the autofocus off. Um, and you should be very comfortable without autofocus. Don't worry about autofocus unless you're in like a football scenario where you're following the coach and you just wanna follow that tracking of the face and you can't rack the whole time. That's a good time there. But if you're shooting like a horror film, take autofocus off and practice and run through your, your steps. Block out your scenes where you tell your actor where to walk and where the camera's gonna be and have your camera in manual so everything is controlled. Um, we're gonna, so raw plus L, another photography feature. Um, I'm gonna send that just to raw. This is just the format that you're getting out of the photography. Underneath on four, now we're getting into what we're here for today. Um, this is your movie recording size. So we have full HD 30, full HD 30P, which <clears throat> the first one is a little better for higher quality. So I'm shooting a short film and I want it to be more cinematic. First one's a better option. The second one, smaller files can be compressed a little more, better for documentary, better for an event like a parade and you don't know what parts you're gonna keep. You know you're gonna keep less than 10%. That second option's a little more viable for you. Um, and both of those were 30 frames per second. So I would expect your shutter speed to be 60, at least to start, unless you got to dial in. Um, full HD 2398, this is what I prefer. And then we have HD 60. I do not, okay, so the nice thing is you're getting more frames per second. So you can slow it down a little bit. The problem is it's only 720p. 720p is below the format standard, 1080p, 4K is really where you should be if you're producing something um, for a high-end client and they're paying you thousands of bucks. If you show up with 720p footage, then it's gonna look, um, it's gonna look as if you don't have the capabilities to, to meet their needs. And then the rest are all 720 because they're just HD and VGA. So I'm gonna stay away from those. We, this camera is old enough that it goes all the way down to 640 by, by 480. Um, the 720p is 12, 1280 by 720 and then 1920 by 1080. I want you to be in these three primarily. Um, if you choose to shoot 720 peaks, you want some extra frames, you want to slow it down. Uh, there is options to upscale it. And um, my, our editor in Texas, he upscales our 1080p that I shot 10 years ago up to 4K. He does it in After Effects. Not something I do, he likes to do it. Um, but it does make our, our footage more valuable for stock sales and things like that. Uh, video snapshot, I'm gonna skip that. Stay down here, yeah, let's skip that. So these bottom two, don't worry about, feel free to play with them. I'm not gonna cover that. Auto light optimizer as well. Now I do wanna cover picture style quickly. I do auto uh, primarily, but if you wanted to mess with, and this is essentially picking different uh, color settings. It's kind of setting some, some uh, the color out for you. Let me get this a little more so you can actually see what I'm doing. Bring the focus there a little more. So now if I kick through our different options, you can set up a custom, which is cool. Um, and then as you go through, you can slightly see, well, you can't see it up there too well probably. Our color is slightly changing. This one more obvious and monochrome than it is on some of the others. Now you have where you can use, you can go in and you can set up your own settings to what you like. That's all good and fine, um, but that was kind of a bigger feature for me in the day before there were so many color options in our editing process. So auto works pretty darn good for what we'll be doing. And then auto white balance. When I started, you had to white balance with an 18% gray card and you had to do it every single time you turn the camera off and back on because we couldn't white balance in post. You can white balance in post. Where that makes us a little lazy is that we're never white balancing in camera anymore. So it doesn't always track well um, with your color. So it's kind of nice to, to go through and check. Is my white balance making sense? So there's a daylight, um, there's for a cloudy day, tungsten lights, white fluorescent lights, 
if you had a flash. Um, auto white balance is okay for most stuff we're doing because you can typically manipulate that in post really easily, changing the color of your image. Questions about this part of the menu? No? Okay. All right, so back up here um, is where you can see those selections that we've made because of how much info we're giving ourselves. So I can click info, that's the info button on the top, right here next to menu. Of course, our menu settings, um, menu again to get out of it. So info is what allows me to change what I'm seeing. This is called, do you know what this is called? Sports guys, live events guys, nobody. Yep. Uh, it's called, I'm referring to what's on the menu, a clean feed. It's a clean feed because this is what I want going out to a monitor, say at Gowan Stadium. You want a clean feed going out. Nobody in the stadium cares what frames you're shooting in and format and all that. So you're getting what's called a clean feed. <clears throat> if I do info, again, that was the basic look that we had before. It's showing us, because I'm not recording right now, it's telling me I can record 2959 or I can take 244 photos. That's what that means. <clears throat> All right, so when I'm back in here, I'm just gonna do our clockwise. Again, wasn't worried about this. Full HD 2997. This is the photography component raw. Uh, this is same with photography, that's saying single shooting. If you saw the three boxes, then that would mean if you held it down, it could shoot, shoot, shoot. Um, and I can't remember what these do photography-wise uh, per second. We're in manual focus. So if I go over and switch this on the lens, now it's trying to do auto again. I don't want that because I just want it to stay on the lens. And it'll do what we call searching or hunting. If I have it in auto, this is where it's going to try and find my hand. And then it's going to look for that. This happened on one of your films, I think. Was that yours? where it was like you had it in auto and it was searching on you. Somebody last semester, it's been long enough now, um, they couldn't figure that out. It was probably because they had their autofocus on. So back to manual, so that way I can keep, I can stay in control. This class is a whole lot about gaining your confidence around the camera and those manual settings is what will do that. Um, when you're sitting there and you're sitting with the client and you're doing an interview and it keeps shooting to the back of the, and coming to the front and looking all over for their face and they're saying this really important and like nice stuff. Um, this happened to me, this is why I know specifically. Uh, take that autofocus off, stay in manual, be in control of your production. Um, again, manual video, 244 photos. I have a smaller card in there, 29.59 on max runtime. That could say less. Mine, when I shoot 8K on my DSLR, Sometimes that'll say less because the camera just can't function anymore. It's getting too hot and its inner workings are basically saying I need to shut it off. So it might say five minutes even though I have 200 gigs left on the card. That's happened. Um, actually happened to me over break. Battery, pretty obvious. Uh, this Q, if I could touch, that would be where I'd select and jump into that menu as we did before, like so. So that Q is pretty important. Push that arrow again to get back out of there. And the battery on this one is flashing, so it's going to die soon. If you see that, um, then you start switching. If you're in an interview, get to a stopping point. Um, you don't want that to happen in the middle. Of, don't ask another question and hope it lasts. It's not your gas light. You don't have 30 miles left. It's going to die pretty quick on these. Auto white balance, because like I said, I like to keep it usually on auto for that. Um, auto for our um, light color space, what we're looking at, uh, again, you can set these things to a manual and set them up uh, specifically, but it's just not really something that students do in this class often because of what we're capable of uh, in post-production. Let me get my shutter back to where I like it. Um, off the top of my head, I can't recall. Let me, I don't want to guess. Which one is that? Oh, that's that auto light opt optimizer, yeah. Um, and you'll see, that's why off, off, off. I don't worry about those bottom, the bottom two on the right and the bottom one right here. I ignore those and I just keep them out of my brain. I don't lose sleep over them. Um, <clears throat> and then I can zoom in 
uh, and that's not going to zoom your image. It's probably worth, worth mentioning. It's not going to zoom the image. Why might I do that? Focus. Focus, thank you. It's just so you can make sure, because these LCD screens are not super strong. Um, they are uh, great for what they are, but they're not super strong. So if you can zoom in quickly and make sure that you have a tighter focus, then I can click back out, and now I'm comfortable and I'm more in focus. And that's everything that I would like to mention currently. What questions do you have? And again, we're going to upload this because uh, a couple people can be here. Isaac, I can fill you in more too because I know it's been a while since you've been around camera. Um, but we'll get this on YouTube so you can pause it and look back. And then if you have questions from that point, um, I do not want you after uh, every single weekend just berating me if it's online. <laughs> Take some time and get comfortable with the camera on your own because every single one of you is not going to be here soon and you're going to be out in the field and you're going to have to be comfortable uh, educating yourself as well. So obviously I'm obsessed with this stuff and I love going over it with you, but there is a, a component of get comfortable digging in and finding the answers too. That's important. Zoe doesn't have all the time in the world to break through the stuff. And we only have three hours in class a week. So um, that's what's allocated for it. So no questions. Um, I'd like to get you guys caught up with the checkouts. I'm trying to think, Zoe, am I forgetting something? Let me look um, in the menu real quickly, just as pull it up if, it, if it'll let us. Oh, I do, I'll show you how to format a card. That's probably one of the most important things we haven't done yet. So you'll see this camera is already set to format card. Typically, all right, first thing, first and foremost, if your card came out of a LAV, like that one did, um, uh, because they are universal for quite a bit, then it thinks it's still in that task cam. It understands that it's still in there. So let it know that it's in a Canon, but you have to dump your media first because it is going to erase that 3.21 gigabytes. <laughs> so, there we go. It's gonna erase that 3.21 gigabytes. It's gone. There is recovery software. It works about 70%. Uh, so if you had 10 clips on there, you might get seven back. You might get none back. And I don't know of anyone ever getting all of it back. Um, now, I will say a cool story about this, probably told you before. Um, you guys have all been here long enough that it starts to get redundant. Um, there was a photographer that traveled to North Korea, invited by North Korea, allowed to come by North Korea's government to, they wanted to show off their land, and he wanted to catch atroci atrocities like hunger, um, poverty, all the things that North Korea did not want him to see. So what he did was, he would snap all these photos of what they told him to, this beautiful statue, this amazing parade, this beautiful park, this grocery store that's fake. Um, and then that's what he showed them he was taking home. But what he didn't show them was he would format, he would take a shot of a starving child, format the card, and then he put that card away. And so when they went through all of his media before he left, they did not see any of that. He came home, did recovery software, saved everything that he could, and published all that stuff, and now he's massively wanted <laughs> by the North Korean um, regime. Um, but I'd say that because it's a fascinating way to work around and know your system, know what you're doing, know how to get away with your story. Just love that he was uh, that resilient to figure that out and that intelligent to be creative. Don't do that <laughs> unless it's like some dire need situation. Um, so formatting a card, super easy. Now it knows that it's a, in a canon. Um, and that's all and very important. Now, what I was showing you on the outside menus, you can do a lot of that stuff. You can do all of that in here. Um, but most of what you need is where I already showed you. Um, what I wouldn't mind finding, if I can recall, is where the auto shutoff is. So picture style, user default, like I said, you can set your own. And here's a little easier. I wish I could see. There we go. So I'm doing, I got the same options that I had out there. And maybe it's a little more clear even. Menu takes me back one step. It's just going backwards. So this is different view options. When I get into my wrenches, you see, you can kind of see the yellow is where I can do more of my actual, okay, there's auto power offset to four minutes. That needs to be on disable. Unless for some reason that's unique to you. 
The other thing is they have their LCD brightness all the way up, which is going to kill my battery, and it's why I can't see it very well in there. Then date and time, the date's not accurate. I know because today's my 10-year anniversary, so I better know that today's the 18th. There we go. I'm spinning it with you guys. Shows you how much I love you. Um, and it's nice to also show that you're in Chicago. That is our time zone. I like to have this accurate. My first five or so years, I didn't do that. And it is a pain trying to go back through my old stuff because it all says like 2010. Um, that's not convenient when you've archived 60 terabytes of footage for your company. Screen color, kind of irrelevant. Some of this stuff's not super relevant. Um, video system needs to be set on NTSC. PAL is for European standards at 25 frames per second. NTSC is more the American standard for 24 frames per second. Make sure you're on that. I'd be surprised if I could catch the difference myself. And then firmware version. Oh, it's probably going to die. Um, the lens and the camera can be updated. The software in it can be updated. Probably way behind because it's on 1.00. Um, and then other cameras like my C70s had eight updates in the last three years. So that's important if there's like certain features that came out that can make the camera more efficient, um, maybe more options in the menu. Uh, so that's some of that stuff that I do a lot that you guys probably don't need to worry about quite yet, but eventually your job might entirely require you to figure that out. Most of what you need to worry about you can see is what I'm saying. Most of you, you can see in here when you're in that setting. Does it feel good? Review for some of you. Isaac, I'll catch you up um, since you didn't have last semester to kind of dive into all of that fun. <clears throat> okay, cool. So for the last few minutes, well, let me wrap up with um, we're going to start on Tuesday, we're going to start our first assignment, our first actual project project. I do want you to take your cameras out this weekend and have some fun with them. I know the weather's going to suck, so shoot some stuff inside, shoot through your windows, whatever. Um, but play with your camera. I don't have a give me 10 shots inside, 10 shots outside type requirement. You're at this point. Shouldn't have to encourage you guys to go work with the cameras that are eventually going to be your main source of income. So play with your camera, mess with the settings, watch some videos on it. We have some videos on it. There's tons of T6i, Canon DSLR stuff. Um, but ultimately, being in the system with the camera is what's going to make you professional enough to go find a job. When I had my T3i, I shot 100 photos a day or 1,000 a week. If I missed a day, I shot extra. And I did that for the first year. Um, <clears throat> and it was remarkable how my confidence skyrocketed uh, because I just every single day I was with my camera in hand. Um, and that's why I got to where I'm at now is because I constantly shot. A book didn't do it. That's for damn sure. That didn't help me at all. Um, and YouTube helped a bunch. But if you don't start using it, then you're only just watching other people do it. You're not going to be get comfortable in that moment with your camera at the football game, at an ag event, whatever it may be. You're not going to be comfortable unless you've been out shooting with it. So, And this semester, we're going to use clapperboards more, tripods and monopods more. Um, we have a few of these, some different models. Uh, I don't want handheld. This first week's OK. Do whatever you like. If you like, check out a tripod, you're more than welcome to, um, or a monopod. Um, but our projects are not going to be handheld unless it called for it for some particular reason. It needs to have a reason, or I'm going to mark you down. If you could have checked out a tripod and got a steady shot, that would be better for your portfolio. That would make you more professional. Um, and that's, yeah, that's my rant. I don't want to rant too long.